Mars has always been a really strong part of our imagination. It's the only viable planet we could ever get to and live on. I remember when I was 10 or 9 years old reading on space and, and people colonizing different planets. Pictures and images of people going up into space, people going to Mars and discovering alien life and water and all this stuff. So, I mean, my fascination of going into space has been rooted in me for the last, I don't know, 25 years. I think about going to Mars. I think about uh, staying on Mars because this particular mission, Mars One, is not going to return uh, the colonists back to Earth. They're going to go there and live there until they die. So if I go to Mars with Mars One, I spend the rest of my life there. Uh, it's going to be a challenge. It's, it is something I think about. It is something I've talked to my husband about quite a bit. We have decided we can make it work. Humans want to explore, want to increase the horizons. Or we want to, to find more out about us, about what we can do. And it gives a lot of feedback. Any research which is done is done in, in a point of view of how you can use a small space and get the maximum out of it. And we have, and currently we have drought in California, but other countries are far worse off. So you want to see with very few water, with, with not so much oxygen, how can we grow our food, how we can grow our crops, how can we you recycle things better, how can we recycle faster. So it always comes back for us too. There are always the benefits. Mars is the first step, really, where we just don't visit the planet. We settle, we make a colony. We can do that, and from there we can go to other places because it is already done, so we can show we did it and then we move on. Then we can build a society from scratch, which is something different. This is very exciting. How it's involved, how will the, the people grow there as a society, how they build it. They have new um, uh, laws, they have a new uh, holidays or whatever it is. How do they work it out together and then go from there in space and then colonize the space and the galaxies. And there are no boundaries in that direction. I think I love that, for example. I personally think these private enterprises aimed at Mars are a great thing. Hooray for that. And I'm supporting them however I can. And in fact, that's NASA's unofficial, if not official, position is, yeah, we want to support that. We want to lend them our technology and our understanding and help them along. There's, there's not an intrinsic conflict. Well, the thing about Mars that interests us, of course, or at least interests me, is the possibility of life. And so I think the priority ought to be search for organic material. And then once we find organic material, search within that organic material for evidence that any of that organic was produced biologically. Can life from Earth survive on Mars? Can we grow plants there? Can humans survive there normally in the lower gravity of Mars? Or is it going to be like space station where they've got to constantly worry about degenerating in the lower gravitational field. We don't know from Mars. But also, when humans go there, they will do a more detailed search for life. So for me, the story about Mars is always about life. Searching for evidence of past life, asking the question if life can survive there in the future. Now I am one of 705 people applying, I guess you could call me a finalist at this point, there will be another cut, but not until sometime in 2015. What happens now is that everybody who is still under consideration, the 705, will now get an interview and will be part of uh, the testing, uh, mental, physical. They're going to run us all through some kind of regimen to determine who is the best, most capable, mentally, physically, emotionally, to go to Mars. And it's my understanding that when they make the next cut in 2015, the number will go down drastically, probably somewhere between 24 and 40. All of those people will then become, uh, they will go through several years of training, astronaut training. And after that, they will choose the first four. Think about four MacGyvers. Because we're working in a team, always a four, so it's not the single person, because if he can't work in a team, 
he has no use basically. So a single mic gamer would be not useful because if the rest of the team don't want to work with him, nothing gets done. So four MacGyvers really can work together. And what we are looking here is they have to be intelligent enough to have a lot of knowledge for the things he had to do. He doesn't need to know everything, but he has to fix machines. He has to do some, some medical issues, some chemicals, some physics and so on. So they have to know that. Then they have to have the enthusiasm to really want to do it, even if it's risky, if it's dangerous. But that's what his purpose is and that's what is fulfilling for him in his life. So they have to see it as a fulfillment and not as a job because it is not a job, it is really there. I want them to be mature people. So when they come and ask me, should I do this and this? I said, you are living on Mars. You have to make the decision and I want to see if you make the right decision. So I'm not telling you what to do in, in decision-based issues. Of course, they will learn in different companies how, how to solve the machines, but not the decision as, as a group. Well, MDRS is the Mars Desert Research Station, which is located in Hanksville, Utah. I discovered there's a few people at Mars One that were interested in going there and, and helping them with repairs of the station. And I wanted to go to just meet the different the other candidates to see what we had in common and also to see what it would be like to live in an environment that is that could be, you know, Mars-like. So I was at the Mars Desert Research Station for four days, five nights, in the middle of nowhere, no water, no food, um, no hot showers, just roughing it. And um, it was a really interesting experience. I, I really got to know more about who I was, as a, who I am as a person, and what I can in, in, endure, and eating astronaut food and not being able to take a shower for five days. That was a pretty challenging experience to me, but I got through it and, you know, we all worked well as a team, so it was a great experience. So part of my research involves not only studying what happens to living organisms when they leave Earth, but also what do you do when you get to these planetary environments of interest? You have to wear a spacesuit and a spacecraft on launch and reentry, but you'll also have to wear a spacesuit when you're on a planetary surface of interest. Planetary surfaces of interest such as the Moon or Mars present a very unusual environment that we don't find here on Earth. For example, reduced gravity, altered radiation, and a very dust-rich environment. And this dust-rich environment is something that the Apollo astronauts experienced on the Moon, and we expect this to also be true on Mars. And so when we're going to Mars, when we're exploring Mars, we need to be considering what the dust environment is like there as well. Small dust particles may produce some type of biological reaction in the lungs of astronauts, and we need to be considering what the chemical reactivity of this material is as well. And so understanding the effects of altered radiation, altered gravity, and this dusty, rich environment is something that we need to consider for future research when performing human exploration of these environments. So there are a number of sorts of spacesuits. Um, the flight suit, where people wear that inside the spacecraft if the, if the air vents out, they, they're at least protected. For walking around Mars, um, the best suit at the moment would be a Apollo type suit or a rear entry kind of suit. An Apollo type suit, you could probably stay in for long periods doing uh, many things. Uh, walking long distances. Then there's a thing called a rear entry suit and that can plug in to a back, back of a rover or back of the Mars base and you climb in through a door at the back and close the door behind you and then unlatch and you can walk away. So you don't need to depressure, you don't need to go in an airlock. Those suits are very good for um, dealing with dust, keeping dust out. Um, they are, however, quite heavy, and they're the main types of spacesuits that might be worn. The real trick is, is what myself and John Rask have been looking at, and others, here at NASA Ames, is that um, what, what can you do when you're in a spacesuit? Can you do science, field science, in a spacesuit? And we know that the Apollo astronauts um, 
They, they came back with bruises, they had injuries, and they found walking around in the suits and doing things um, physically very difficult. And the question is, is can, can you do field science as field scientists do, collecting samples, determining hypotheses, deciding on whether you're thinking in the right direction, working things out in terms of what things are. Can you do all that in a spacesuit today on Mars? They're coming up so many new designs. So don't think about what the astronauts, the Apollo astronauts have, what they have now for extravehicular activity. These are all old types because NASA did not want to spend the money to put new. So we have very new developments. We have a lot of companies. We have one contact with Paragon already to develop space. But there might be even newer ones. And we will test them out here. So we want the most comfortable because they have to go out, they have to uh, the solar panels, they have to be repaired, for example. If one of the ro robots who actually dug out the soil, the water will be removed and then you have oxygen and water out of it, uh, they have to be repaired too. So you need a lot of repairs and then they build a new habitat on that. Currently we have in 2018 the first robotic mission to send a satellite for communication and to find the right spot and then 2022 will be five to six robotic missions at the same time and the robots will build the habitats basically there. So it's very inflatable and then they work and get the soil on it. The reason for that is the radiation. So five meters of soil already covers against the radiation but it can be up to 11 meters if necessary. How we will do the settlement on Mars in, in the first stages so we have the top of the rockets, basically, but this is only to go in and out. What we have in the back are inflatables. And in the beginning, we will have two inflatables already on Mars. One inflatable is around 1,000 square feet, and we have two of them. So two can live in each 1,000 square feet. And we have this redundant system because something might happen, but then all four live in 1,000. And then some people think they are in the darkness. No, they are not in the darkness. Because you can have glass fiber cables through the soil into the habitat, which brings you the sunlight, real sunlight, in the habitat, so it will be bright. And then we have, of course, inside sunlight lamps and all these things for the plants that need lamps too. So, and then both habitats will be filled with enough water and with oxygen. And if that is not happening, nobody will leave Earth. So this is a first requirement. So it has to be the two habitats fully functional, the production of, of water and oxygen, and both have to be filled, then we will leave Earth. So if we say now 2024 in, in autumn, we will leave, we arrive in 2025. At the end of the day, you know, I'm not doing this for me, I'm doing this for, you know, our, our, our race, our, the human race, you know, it's, it's not because I want to go to Mars. I feel like I have what it takes to, you know, help this dying planet so it's more hospitable to human beings in the future. Um, that's why I'm doing it. It's not because I feel like I need to go to Mars. I just feel like I can help. I could do something to, to make it a livable environment for all of us. Well, you know, a lot of people think uh, we're going to have to move at some point, that we're, the Earth is not going to last forever, we're going to run out of resources, um, and that it's not too soon to be looking for our next home. Even Stephen Hawking says, you know, we're going to have to go, we're going to have to move to Mars. He thinks it's not going to happen for quite a while. But um, I, think it, I think the idea is that um, it's there, it might become our new home, it is certainly the object of our next space quest. It is certainly uh, a place where we could go. I mean, there's kind of a, a hope, a dream attached to moving to Mars, which is kind of a do-over. We could start again. We could take all of the best things we figured out on Earth, the best ways we've learned to live on Earth, and leave behind the things that you know we haven't done so well. The Mars One candidates, I think, are, are a wonderful resource. It's a wonderful look at the human interest in going into space. And what I particularly like about it is that it shows that Mars exploration is not just a bunch of cold facts about Mars. It's about connecting Mars to the human experience uh, and all the motivations for doing that. The human experience is much broader than just the scientific understanding of Mars. 
The science of Mars will be part of that. It'll feed into it. But we humans are more than just science. And the diversity of interests and motivations that are emerging from the Mars One candidates shows that. And I think that's wonderful. Even if none of them ever actually end up going to Mars because it's just so hard to do, it's still very interesting.